This town hall is a presentation of Sinclair Cares. Hello everyone and welcome to our Sinclair Cares Town Hall. We hope that for the next hour as we share mental health support and hope, you or someone you love will find help in ways you never thought possible. My name is Liz Bonus, and I'm a national medical reporter with Sinclair Broadcast Group. We now know that one in every six young people, ages 6 to 17, struggles with a mental health concern. Half of those who do develop a mental illness will report that it started by the time they were 14. That now makes suicide the second leading cause of death for youth as young as 10 years old. So during this hour, Sinclair Broadcast Group has partnered with NAMI. That is the National Alliance on Mental Illness for this campaign. Our goal is to encourage mental health awareness, especially in young adults. We will hear more from our team at NAMI in just a moment. But before we do, we want you to know there is support and hope available right now around the clock, 24-7. If you or someone you know needs help, just scan the QR code you see on your screen or go to SinclairCares.com to find a local NAMI location near you. We will keep that QR code up this entire show so you can check in at any time. We do want to begin our program dedicated to our mental health by sharing a story with you. There is an amazing mom and dad and their three daughters who have a story to tell. They found out sometimes the key to recovery is to involve the whole family. Will you spin this and whatever letter you know, she uh, she uh, her uh, number you land on. For the Phillips family, the need to start therapy here at Ohio's Central Clinic Behavioral Health started several months ago. Typically we work with individuals, but they are in a unit. Cousin Desiana came to stay with them, and she's living with diabetes. Well, I love when Miss Kendra cook her macaroni. Miss Kendra, who is also mom to Shayla and Tanaya, owns a catering company. The whole family enjoys making food and art. When it came to the art of family dynamics, however... It got to the point to where I, I, I needed some help, and I had to start somewhere. So together, here with Miss April, the family focused on one goal at a time. We talk about school and we play games like we're connecting. Me and Miss April, we play games, we talk about our friends. They soon learn that from attention problems with homework to patience and kindness making meals together, some of those games are we're building frustration tolerance. Mental health counselor April Carr says even though, as dad puts it, there are ups and downs in any journey. Like one minute we cool, next minute we beefing. Working together as a family, you can accomplish a lot. The secret, this family says, is not to be afraid to ask for help. Some people might be a little too scared to actually come out and talk about their feelings and stuff like that. Here, they can let you, you know, your, my, their therapist might know something I might not know about them. It helped a lot. Like, when I say a lot, it's like, it helped me more than what I thought. And with that, we turn to Dr. Ken Duckworth. He is the chief medical officer for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. He is also the author of NAMI's first book, You Are Not Alone, the NAMI Guide to Navigating Mental Health. Dr. Duckworth, thank you for being here today. I know you are also a child and adolescent psychiatrist, so a subject very close to your heart, and the Phillips family. Thank you so much. Love that family. They're problem solving, they're engaging, they're talking about things. These are big, big achievements because the kids are gonna grow up knowing that if they develop a vulnerability in the mental health space, which happens commonly in kids, they can talk about it. It's a safe thing to take up. So I heard him say, the dad say, asking for help, it was hard to do. So I know NAMI, that's one of their goals, just to, for people to reach out. How do you achieve that? Yeah, well, one of our major uh, slogans is you are not alone, that there are 650 affiliates across America where you will find people just like you who are dealing with a mental health journey or they love someone who does. That is to say we have family members and people with first-person experience and they're there to support you, so you don't have to do this alone. 
So one of the things I found interesting about that family was it actually started with a child who had diabetes. And you wouldn't think of that as bringing on a mental health concern, but they said it brought up so many things in the conversation and at the dinner table. Yeah. And, it, and they found it made a huge difference when you know they reached out to a counselor. So I guess I wouldn't think of that as a warning sign, but what are some of those warning signs that say, hey, our family might need Well, help? remember, big stresses generate anxiety, can generate depression, can lead to risk for addiction. Big stress, having a child with diabetes, that's scary for parents and it's scary for the child. So being able to problem solve around that. So some of the things you look for are changes in behavior, drop off in school functioning, and particularly with teenagers, they may not want to hang out with the parents so much, but if they lose interest in their peer group, that's another sign of trouble. So that's a good uh, kind of rule of thumb. Pediatricians know a lot about mental health. Everybody likes their pediatrician. And so that's one place to start. NAMI is another. So let's talk about that. What kind of resources does NAMI offer to a family or to even to young people? So we have support groups all across America and we have education programs. So people can be taught from a family perspective, what are these conditions? What might you see when a parent is dealing with young kids? We have an online program called NAMI Basics when we know parents of young kids can't come to a meeting in person so that you can take that whole program online and it identifies common areas of emotional vulnerability for kids and some problem solving techniques. So I know you wrote the book sort of as a compliment to what yes. NAMI does. Um, NAMI doesn't charge for services, correct? Let's talk free. a little bit about you know the whole you're not alone and why that's so important to know. Yeah, NAMI's about, about love and support of people who live with mental health conditions. And you know this book is also personal to me. My dad had very bad bipolar disorder and was a very loving person and my family couldn't talk about it. So I look at the Phillips family and I'm like, we've made so much progress in our society. And this book doubles down on that idea. I interviewed 130 people aged 16 to 100 from 38 different states from every walk of life. They all use their name. The reason they use their name is they didn't want people to feel ashamed. Most books by doctors say my patients are my greatest teachers, but there's no real patients in this book, don't worry. And I flip that on its head. NAMI's all about sharing your experience, being yourself. That helps other people not feel alone. We know that in the COVID-19 pandemic, we all sort of felt alone. Have you seen a need for your services grow since then? And what do you offer to sort of address that? We've had an explosion of services. Every mental health practitioner is swamped with care requests. Uh, and for adolescents in particular, think about when you're an adolescent, your job is to get out in the world, try a sports team, get on the drama club, you know, sing make friends, ask people out on dates, get rejected. All the things that happen to all of us. These kids spend time in Zoom school, in their parents' basement or living room, and a lot of kids suffered from that. You look at the data from the Center for Disease Control, you know, young people reported high rates of anxiety and depression at levels not seen before COVID. What's interesting about young people is they're also more willing to talk about it. And this is a great gift that they're bringing to the table. And I think NAMI is partly to sort of give accolades to for that because you have started the conversation, which is so important. But I heard you address that stigma. Yes. It's, it's still there. It's still there, but it's improving. I couldn't have written a book with real people 10 years ago. And you look at some of the famous athletes, politicians, celebrities that come out with, I'm, this is part of who I am. It helps people say, wait a minute, I know it isn't something that's socially desirable, Right, I still might feel some shame, but if John Fetterman can get treated for depression, if Simone Biles can be out with her mental health condition, if Michael Phelps can talk about it, wait a minute, these are all people I'd like to be with, like. And maybe the thing that I'm experiencing isn't something I need to hide from and delay seeking help for years. Like with medical conditions, mental health conditions are best treated sooner rather than later. So every person who shares their story and is courageous in owning what they're living with and how they're working with it is making a difference in this larger societal environment. Well, thank you for writing the book. Uh, I know we have links to your organization so we can find out more about that. Your target audience is everyone? Human beings. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, you know, people who've experienced anxiety, depression, addiction, bipolar disorder, trauma, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. These are the people in the book. These are people who've dealt with it in churches and had various responses. 
supportive and unsupportive. In the workplace, various responses support how you work this in your marriage, how a father works with his son who's hearing voices. These are real people who've actually solved problems. This is the book I could have used for myself before I became a doctor. This is the only book I really wanted to write, and fortunately NAMI you know, has given me this gift to write this book. Thanks for giving us or sharing your gifts with us. Thank you for your leadership and taking on the topic of mental health. It's a very important topic. Yeah, we agree. All right, Dr. Duckworth, thank you for being here again. The book is You Are Not Alone. We so appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Liz. Those who've struggled with mental health concerns tell us the pandemic was exceptionally hard. Recently, I had a chance to find out why with the help of one brave college student. She said it took a while, but eventually she had the courage to tell her mom what was going on. She recently helped us talk about a new report on mental health in the pandemic from the CDC. Her name is Marcia Gauze, and here's a little bit of her backstory. I thought it would be great. I don't have to go to school. I'm so happy. You never know it when you talk to Marcia now here at Ohio's Central Clinic Behavioral Health. But like many high school students, it all started when the pandemic shut down her classroom. At first, she missed her life, but was doing okay. And then it was like, I don't want to be in my room anymore. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to do work. I don't want to do anything. And even when she would reach out to her close friend. She would say, oh, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to die. And I'll be like, same. So it sounds like you were thinking of harming you. Thinking of harm? Well, yeah, I was. Marcia Gauze was not alone. This new CDC report on youth mental health found kids are in crisis. More than a third of high school students surveyed in this pandemic reported their mental health was poor. Nearly half said they felt persistently sad or hopeless. When school connectedness was taken away, more than one in four said they were seriously considering taking their own lives. I always felt like if I wasn't here, maybe things would be better. That's when Marcia's mom did something she said was very hard to do. Reach out for help beyond her own family. It changed her life and I'm glad that we made that choice. And then when I saw and heard that it was Miss Erin, I was like, oh my gosh, it's another black woman. And I, uh, you don't see that a lot. And I really appreciated that. Miss Erin is Erin Kennedy. She specializes in teenage mental health. Miss Aaron says if you think your child is struggling with a mental health concern right now, you're probably right. But we've had a significantly higher number of new cases coming in over the last two years. Her advice, she told me, is to listen to kids and watch for any kind of sudden changes. So maybe school's not going as well as it used to go, or they're not talking to friends as much as they used to, or they're not going out of the house as much as they used to. Um, those types of things are usually warning signs that something isn't right. What is right is getting the right kind of help. For Marcia, now a junior cadet, and getting ready to attend college, it changed things. She does occasionally still feel sad, she says, but after intense talk therapy, she told me it's different now. It's not like, oh, I just don't want to be here anymore, or I wish I could die. It's more, I wish life would just pause for a moment and give me a breath. So I think like that now instead of going to the extreme side of it. So right out of this, we want to remind you, if someone you love is struggling, you can call 988. It is a suicide and crisis lifeline available 24 hours a day in both English and Spanish, and all calls are confidential. But we also wanted to check in with Marcia Gauze to see how she's doing now. Marcia is joining us virtually. Hello to you. Thank you for being here and sharing your experience. How are you doing now, and are you sort of continuing to talk about this journey with others? I'm doing great, actually. Uh, I've been continuing to talk about my mental health journey with almost anybody, anybody I can talk to. What do you tell them? What do you want them to know? Uh, I tell them that mental health is fluid. It, it's hard some days, and it's really it's days where I just don't want to do anything, but then it's days where it's really good, and I'm able to do whatever I want to do. But I try to push through during the good days and the hard days. 
So tell me a little bit about how you do that. Did you learn kind of specific tools as you were in counseling and sort of coping with your own feelings? Um, she tells me, my therapist tells me not to always rely on my thoughts so much. They, my thoughts tend to make everything really, really big when it's not even that big. She's like, you're the main character in your own story, so your problems always seem bigger than they really are. So I try to just think about what I, how I feel about my thoughts and not put so much emphasis and thought like feelings into what I'm thinking. Interesting. So you've sort of continued this journey. What advice do you have for other people if they're watching this right now and, you know, they saw your story and they said, wow, I'm really feeling that way or I'm considering harming myself or taking my own life. What do you want them to know? I want to know that in those moments when things really seem hard and that when your problems seem really, really big, just to take a step back and to really think about your whole life, honestly, just Think about what the impact of you doing this harming yourself can do, not only to yourself, but to other people, your family, your loved ones. And to realize that there will be good days, there will be bad days, but you just have to hold on for the good days. Well, that is good advice. And I know as I was sort of following your story a little bit, your mom just really touched my soul. And I wondered, you know, how is she doing? What message do you have for her? Because she was just a rock for you in all this. Yeah, she is really a rock. I love and appreciate my mother. Um, my mother, she's just always there. And I, I'm grateful that I have a mother that is there and that is willing to listen and willing to take the steps necessary, necessary to make sure that their child is okay. I really appreciate my mom. Yeah, you know, I thought it was interesting when she said, you know, I always thought we should just sort of keep it in the family. And she said, you really felt that way too. So how did you overcome that barrier? You know, did you almost feel like ashamed that you had to reach out for help outside the family? I felt a little ashamed because there's this stigma that if you go seek help, you're automatically insane or crazy. And I don't think you should ever put those uh, words with anyone who's struggling with mental health and really online people, TikTok and Instagram, people on there who, uh, the awareness they put out saying that it's okay to seek help. And I realized that I also talked to my mom about it. I said, mom, I'm not crazy. I'm not insane. It's not crazy or insane to seek help. And you have to also get that thought out of your head. And so I was able to seek help because of the awareness that is the mass amount of awareness that is going on right now about mental health. Yeah, and part of that, of course, is because of you. So final thought, I think it's interesting that you've continued to stay in counseling. How important do you feel like that is? It's very, very important because at the end of the day, if you can't talk to someone about how you're feeling, then it's going to take a toll on you, on every part of you, your, your mental health, your physical health. Even if you can't find, like, psychiatric help, just... Talk to your friend, talk to your mother, talk to a stranger about it, because getting it out can really help more than keeping it in. Wow, that's a powerful lesson there that you've learned. Marcia, we think that you are just amazing. You will help so many people. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm glad to be here. And still ahead, when it comes to your child's mental health, it can take time to get appointments with counselors and therapists, but there is another option for support that often gets overlooked. We'll have details after the break. I want teens to know that it's okay to like have days that's not good as long as you like get back up and move on from what happened. Welcome back, everybody, to our Sinclair Cares Town Hall, Mental Health Support and Hope. As we continue our focus on young people, NAMI reminds us that emergency room visits for mental health concerns in teens went up by more than 30% in this pandemic time. One in five young people report that the pandemic had a significant negative impact on their mental health. 
Please remember if you or a loved one needs help, just scan the QR code that you see on your screen or go to SinclairCares.com and find a local NAMI location near you. Part of what happened as those numbers started to climb in the pandemic, wait times for counselors went way up. In some cases, it is now six months before a teen or a young person can get professional help from a counselor. But in the aftermath of a new CDC survey, other healthcare providers remind us, talking to your primary care doctor may be one step that could help in early intervention, and here's why. I feel like more teens are going through it now, like, are struggling. Claire, who's in the ninth grade here at Ohio's St. Ursula Academy, is right. More teens are struggling with mental health concerns, especially since the start of the pandemic. The CDC just released its first youth risk behavior survey. It looks at trends since the fall of 2021. Girls fared far worse than boys. Six in ten girls felt persistently sad or lonely. That's nearly double the rate of teen boys. Nearly one in three girls gave serious thought to attempting suicide. I mainly just talked to like my mom about it and then like I like slept it off. Parental support is critical for teens, but with counseling appointments often booked weeks out, Dr. Denise Warwick of Ohio's Tri Health told me every parent or teen needs to know it is okay to tell or talk to your primary care doctor. Parenting is a struggle. It's tough some days. And so sometimes we have to prepare um, parents with tools about how to manage, you know, um, you know, challenges in parenting lives. Dr. Warwick says we often think of the doctor as taking care of your physical health, especially when kids are little. But at any age and any stage, your child's family doctor can start an important healing conversation. I think everyone goes through a little bit of something. I don't think I've had it bad, but I know being a high school junior especially is really stressful. Or even a medication to stop a student from going toward a decline that leads to serious consideration of suicide. And again, as we address wait times, we do want to remind you the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is a free and confidential resource available 24-7. You can dial 988 at any time. So with that, we thought we'd open up the discussion for other resources that you may have in your own school or community with the help of some great nationwide resources we've been learning about. So joining me now, Gloria Walker is the executive director of NAMI Urban Greater Cincinnati. And Anna Barrage is the leadership development coordinator of Youth Move with NAMI Urban Greater Cincinnati. And Maddie Bruns is a high school student at St. Ursula Academy, the school that we just had a chance to visit in that great city. Thank you all for being part of this important discussion. Maddie, I want to start with you. Why do you want to be here today to talk about mental health? A lot of teens not comfortable speaking out about this topic. We love that you are here. Thank you. Um, I have been a person who has always had some minor mental health struggles, and it was really important to me that I um, saw and found the help that I needed. And then also, our school has a, uh, a mental health alliance that we recently got started in the past couple of years because we had a Hope Squad chapter. But what we found was that it, that model didn't really work the way we had hoped it would for our community. And so I had a lot of friends who said, hey, we would love to see this work better. So I wanted to see how we could make mental health care and mental health support more accessible within our school community. So how did you do that? So what we did was we took a look at our old system, how it worked, how it didn't work. And then we expanded membership um, of our mental health alliance. So we basically rebuilt it such that um, any student who wants to can apply and with a reference letter go through uh, mental health like support training and then be available. So we opened up the membership a lot which is really important in terms of making it more accessible to the student community. Well, good for you. We're going to continue this conversation with you in just a moment, but we want to talk to Anna. As I recall, you got involved in a program called Family to Family because you help young people in a very unique and personal way. Can you share a little bit about how you help them and how that program helped you? Uh, yes, uh, Anna, and um, I have two kinship care children in our home. Uh, they came to us and they came along with some 
uh, remnants of problems. And so I was trying to figure out how to help those children um, and help myself also. So I was talking to someone and they referred me, they said, well, I know someone and it was Gloria Walker. And I went and spoke with Gloria and she, you know, she started to tell me about basics and NAMI's program. And so learning about ba the family to family helped me to be able to better deal with the children that uh, we have in our home. And Gloria, that's a perfect transition to you. I know you are passionate about the family to family program, especially for black and brown people. We talked earlier uh, a little bit about why it's hard in some families and some cultures to go outside the family for help. So what is the family family program and what should we know about it? Well, it's, um, it's an empowering program because it, for eight weeks, families come together and they learn about these illnesses. I always tell them you can't walk away from here and do diagnosis, but you learn a lot. Schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, major mental illnesses that if they're not treated, um, can interfere with living and interfere with a person's life progress. So we do that, and I think, in fact, I'm sure that as parents and as families get to know more about these illnesses and that there are treatments and that there is, um, there is recovery. And so the sooner people get that treatment, the more they know, the sooner they get that treatment, the better their outcomes. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about it because once, you know, it's, it's when you're teaching and you see people's eyes light up and they'll, it's like, they're saying, Oh, that's what this is about. That's what's going on. So I think the more we can get people just in the community talking about it more, understanding what's going on, the more we can get rid of the stigma and that stigma keeps people from getting the treatments they need early on. So I'm delighted to know that youth and young people are talking about this and that they're reaching out and getting the information. I hope that they can talk with their parents, their guardians, someone who can also help them by knowing more about these illnesses. Yeah, your program is amazing. I know you train others to help in their own families. And we are going to continue this discussion. But first, I wanted to ask Maddie a follow-up question. You know, she's excited that young people are talking about their own mental health journeys. Can you share a little bit about your own journey? What did you go through and how did you find help? Yeah, absolutely. So I have always been a person who's like a perfectionist. I've always been expecting the most from myself and when I couldn't deliver that for my own self, I got to be really hard on myself. And it was something that I struggled with a lot. And so eventually I, uh, in the beginning of my junior year at, uh, in high school, I started seeing a therapist. And it was incredibly beneficial for me because um, I, she told me a lot about like excessive anxiety and what that looks like and how she was sort of seeing it in what she heard me talk. And I also, through that process, I got an ADHD diagnosis, which was so much more beneficial to me than I would have expected it to be in terms of my mental well-being, because I found that it helped me to understand a lot more about myself and how when I couldn't just sit down and get something done or when I couldn't do something as well as I would have hoped, that's why. It's because my brain works differently than I thought it did. So learning more about myself through that process was incredibly beneficial to me learning to be gentler with myself and learn how to work with my learning style and my work style. And so that was incredibly helpful for me. Wow, good for you. What a story of courage and just you loving on you. It's so great to hear. We're gonna pause this conversation for just a quick break, but we'll have more with this panel in just a couple of minutes. You guys have been amazing, so stay with us. Coming up, some simple steps you can take to improve your mental health, starting with a few foods to fight stress. We'll be right back.
that's always been something that's open to me because I know that I'm not alone and that's become very apparent to me and I just want people to know that they aren't alone either. Welcome back, everyone, to our National Town Hall. One of the things that NAMI, or the National Alliance on Mental Illness, recently shared with us is that taking care of your body can also help your mind. People with depression have a 40% higher risk of developing heart disease and diabetes compared to those who do not struggle with this mental health concern. One in three people with mental illness also struggle with addiction and substance use disorder. Knowing this, we remind you, if you or a loved one needs help, please scan the QR code that you see on your screen or go to SinclairCares.com to find a local NAMI location near you. But part of the reason that we're also talking about this today is it also means that fitness and food can make a difference in how you feel, especially when it comes to anxiety and depression, which the World Health Organization now says have topped our list of mental health concerns since the start of this pandemic. A survey of 90 countries reports cases of both are now up 25%. Families with young children say they are seeing more of this as well. It is estimated as many as one in three people report symptoms improve when they add in activities such as exercise. They really feel a lot better after just a few weeks. Top that off with a few healthy foods, according to a new summary report in WebMD, and you really may have the perfect prescription for calm conditions. These foods include berries loaded with antioxidants to help stressed cells, spinach or other greens packed with the happy mineral magnesium, oatmeal, which has good carbs to boost the feel-good compound in your brain known as serotonin, oranges packed with vitamin C to help calm the mind, and finally, dark chocolate with 70% cocoa can help with relaxation. So we want to pick it up there with our panel again, talk a little bit about what we were talking about in that story and what we also heard Gloria talk about family to family and taking care of you. Learning about your body and learning about your brain and understanding that they are all one in one. And NAMI encourages people to talk, to make friends, to be part of a, a supportive group, a supportive community that understands what those people that are taking that training go through. And so they come back to NAMI because we're listeners and they, you know, as they are trying to process what's going on with their family, they understand that it's more than just a person that has the illness, the whole family is impacted by what's going on. So that the more families can talk with each other and say, okay, uh, I can't diagnose this as an anxiety, but these symptoms and this behavior is something that I think we need to go take get help for we need to maybe talk with a therapist or let's talk with someone let's go to nami let's talk with the people there people who have already gone through this we know like one in five are dealing with a serious mental illness and it can impact and break up a family so being outward with it talking about it finding information and i don't mean just on googling it I mean to, you know, talk with people who can. And yeah, it's unfortunate that to get a therapist, we have to wait so long. Um, everybody's now talking about mental illness and people are finding it easier to get to a therapist, but finding one that can take them in within a short period of time is very difficult. Yeah, and that's why so, we're so glad that NAMI has this program. It is no charge, it is family to family, and we know that you can find out more about it through your website, of course, and scanning that QR code. But Maddie, she kind of set you up there. You know, teens are now talking about this, which is wonderful, but a lot of teens kind of 
hide their feelings. I'm kind of wondering, did you hide it from your family for a long time before you had the courage to speak up? I mean, a, a little bit. I always, they always knew that I was someone who wanted to be doing my best, but the extent to which I like felt about myself, depending on how I was doing, that was something that I very much like, kept myself. Yeah, well, we are so proud of you for talking about a tough subject as a young person. We think it's amazing. And Anna, we want to kind of wrap up with you. You know, Nami tells us that one in five high school students had serious thoughts of suicide recently. And I know you take in children and you've struggled with them. Have you worried about them, you know, just harming themselves? And how have you worked with sort of interrupting that? Um... I'm, uh, we, my kids do see a therapist um, because we saw some things happening and we knew that they had a biological history. So they are in therapy, uh, but I also go with them to therapy uh, every other week. I am there uh, to make sure I understand what they're dealing with so I can uh, offer support to them. Uh, keeping that door open, which I think is very important because oftentimes the children are saying we're not listening. So I'm trying to make sure I'm listening and being aware of changes that are occurring. Yeah, you know, we've heard a lot about listening. Thank you for reminding us of just how important that really is. And Maddie, we want to give you the final word here. What is your biggest advice to teens who maybe are watching this and saying, boy, that sure sounds like me and they're struggling right now? I'd say really just like getting to know yourself and also not letting all of the other like things in your life affect your mental space in terms of like social media, what you see and hear. And it seems like other people are like, you know, doing a lot of things that you're not. Remembering that social media is not real remembering to talk to yourself about how you're feeling or talking to friends or a school counselor or even like a favorite teacher about how you're feeling and how you can like express yourself and express your feelings in the world so that you get the most authentic version of yourself and so that you sort of weed out all of the other outside forces that can have an impact on your mental health and your mental space. Yeah, being true to you. Thank you so much, Maddie, Gloria, Anna. Thank you for just taking the time to talk about a tough subject. What you are doing will help so many people. We appreciate you being here today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We've been talking about a tough subject, as we mentioned, but there is always help available. A reminder as we head to break, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is free and available to help you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just dial 988. Still ahead, this next conversation is one every parent should hear about talking to your teen about mental health. It's not easy, but it could be life-saving. We'll be right back. I think that it's just important to recognize that it's just as important as physical health. You are worthy and there's people out there that want to help you. Welcome back everyone. Whatever you're doing right now, you may just wanna pause and take a breath and watch this next story. It touches on some tough topics. As we head into it, we do want to remind you if you or a loved one needs help, just scan the QR code that you see on your screen or go to SinclairCares.com to find a local NAMI location near you. The pandemic's toll on our children has been felt in so many homes. Often the first line of defense is mom and dad. As we've been sharing with you, one big concern, suicide. It is now the second leading cause of death among youth ages 10 to 14. And as our news team in upstate New York found out firsthand, it can be extremely emotional when a child opens up about dark and scary emotions. Here's Megan Coleman. When the pandemic still had many of us social distancing and adapting to a new world, we found the impact on mental health was impossible to ignore. My friend and colleague Michael Benny was leading a candid conversation with two teenage boys and their mothers. Then, to the surprise of everyone, this happened. Is it okay? Um, Peyton came to me early in the school year and expressed that he was having difficulty, that he, in his words, wasn't doing okay. Um, 
in talking to him, we found that he was having worsening bouts of depression and anxiety for a couple years, even prior to the pandemic. But since the pandemic had started, things had gotten very dark, very bad for him. Um, and he admitted that he did have a plan. Um, that was very difficult to hear. It was very, very scary. Um, I'm glad that he came to me and he sought help. You know, we went to the pediatrician. He is one of those kids we had to resort to medication with. He's been in therapy for, you know, about six months or so, and um, things are looking better, much better. Um, but that was not an easy thing to hear. As a parent, I felt like maybe I had failed in some way, that I didn't recognize something I should have. Maybe I didn't talk about it enough with him, you know, before that. Um, but I realized it doesn't matter what I did or didn't do before. It just mattered what I did going forward. Peyton, you have a very special mom who loves you a lot. I do. What is your message to other parents? D should you bring it up? Talk about it. Say the word, say the actual word. Say it. Check in with them. Ask them what's the checking going in is on. different than saying the actual word. Say the word. Say the word, and when I say check in, it's not just the, hey, how's it going, how was your day? Because you're gonna get those, it was fine, it was good. <laughs> you know, did you learn anything? Yeah. You know, you're going to get those one or two, you know, word answers. When I say check in, sit down with your kid, kids, have deep, meaningful conversations, pay attention to what they're drawing, what they're writing about, what is going on in their room, um, because I think that there's a lot more of this going on out there than I think a lot of us really realize, or at least that I realized until we experienced what we experienced. Peyton, what's the best way for a parent to really check in and get a good answer? Not just the, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, okay, mom, yeah. Uh, uh. Um, you have to make them comfortable. That's very important. and. If you ask them something they really don't want to talk about, you have to give them that leeway because it, it would be very awkward to just like tell me now because you wouldn't want to go to them ever again if they're like, just tell me. You got to give them, make them comfortable. You guys, you guys have... Can I just say something? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know you guys before today, but Kim and Peyton, I want to hug you. <laughs> and we can't, right? Yes. But yeah, but Peyton... Please know that when it's when there are dark days, ah, there's there's always someone. Okay, I I tell my boys that they don't listen, so maybe you listen. <laughs> I know you do, but it's it's hard. There's always when you feel your your loneliest. There's always always someone. You sir are a fine and sensitive guy, and you had a little trouble listening to that. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I guess if I were to speak to it, like, my mom was saying, like, we just met these people 30 minutes ago, and I don't know, it's just hard, like, paying you. You got your whole life ahead of you, man, like, you're on a great team. You're, it sounds like you're a bright young man great athlete, like, you're, you're loved, man. People are here for you. Thank you. And I'm glad that you have such a tremendous mom who's willing to <laughs> help you out with this because not all kids and not all moms know how to go about this. And that's really what's heartbreaking and de devastating about it. But I'm just glad that things are doing better now. It's hard stuff. Yeah. It's hard stuff. Let's take a breath. Since 2014, one upstate children's hospital has seen more than 400% of an increase in kids in crisis.
Thank you, Megan, from our Syracuse station. And again, we remind you, coming out of this emotional interview, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is free and available to help 24-7. Just dial 988. So, as we mentioned, a difficult and important conversation, and we do want to talk to, about how the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, is really reaching out to try and be a resource for young people in a whole new way. And that brings us to our final guest today. Zane Landon represents NAMI's Next Gen Group. This is an advisory group representing voices of young adults nationwide to help advise and innovate how NAMI works with young people. Zane, thank you for being here. I have to know your reaction to a story like that my first reaction is I really see my story in those people and I'm very happy that they're receiving the help that they deserve and that they're able to also speak on it because speaking out is very scary at times you never know how people are going to react and sometimes it's not the best and I really hope when people do they do find that positive to support support because it's exactly what like I said they deserve and growing up I have had thoughts of suicide a lot and it was even more prevalent when I was going through the university system and a lot of students and young people are experiencing this but I'm really happy that they are more open about it and they are reaching more people. Those thoughts you obviously learned ways to interrupt them or how did you get to this place where you're like hey I'm healthier and I can share my journey with others? For me when I was younger, like five to six is when I first experienced mental health conditions, it was a very early age with intense anger, depression, and anxiety. And we don't really hear a lot about anger, but it was my experience growing up. Luckily, my family knew about mental health and they're very aware about the resources, which I think can, can definitely uh, mitigate some of the barriers that young people have to experience because sometimes, or a lot of times, they have to navigate the whole system alone. And how do you even do that? I wouldn't even know how to do that. I would have been overwhelmed. But my family knew, and that's why I'm always an advocate for young people or adults, but also for parents, because they need to know that these resources exist and that there is a path and there's a voice for people that can help them, like NAMI, with free resources, because there there's already enough barriers when it comes to mental health care. We've been talking a lot about that, and one of the things that you have in this Next Gen program is a way for them to just reach out to you and get free help. Tell me how you do that. What is it that you offer? You know, how do you get to this group, the group that's you, and sort of you know, help them get to a better path? I mean, there are several free resources on NAMI, and it's all about just reaching out. Finding someone to reach out to, I think, is the first step, and I think it's a very important step, because, again, I think that there is courage in reaching out for help. And when I see people reach out for help, even when they're completely navigating it alone, I, I applaud them so much because it takes a lot of effort and a lot of reflection to look at yourself and say, I don't like this. I'm going to change something about it. And I'm going to take a deliberate approach and, a, and talk to an organization, speak to someone, and see what resources they offer. If it's group therapy or support systems or even just statistics or a resource, anything that can start that conversation. And maybe you bring that to your family or again, your family members bring that to the person that they need to help. And about suicide, I experienced that when I was very, um, growing up, but it really was prevalent when I was in university where I was literally actually engaging in self-harm, where I was actually hurting myself. And I thought about suicide almost all the time for a whole semester in university. And I experienced it before, but this time around it was a lot more intense and a lot more common in my mind. And I decided that I needed to do the right thing for myself and that is take the semester off and rethink everything. And because I had seen a psychologist for so many years, I did have the tools, but it wasn't like this. So I really need to think, what exactly do I need? What do I want? And what do I, what do I not want to see anymore in myself? And I said, I need to communicate more. I was a communications major. I was studying communication, and even though communication is, is positive when it comes to business and all these different facets, it's also important when you need help. Because you, you may not know exactly what you need, but you know you need the help. So you may not be able to articulate what you need, but just you articulating that you need help is so important. And that can definitely build bridges with the people around you. And people, and the people also have the right to know what you're experiencing, and that they probably don't want to see you go through something like that, or to die by suicide. So that's what I would say, and I also would say, do not be afraid of the word suicide. I know they mentioned it in the past story. Don't be afraid to mention it. It's not gonna plant the idea in someone's head. That's already been disproven that it's gonna plant the idea. 
use the word, and it really shows that they're really thinking about it. That when someone talks to you and they bring up suicide, wow, they're actually talking to me about suicide. They know about it, and I shouldn't be as ashamed. And if they share their story with me to make me feel comfortable and give me that space and grace, why, can't, why don't I deserve that too? And I should be able to feel that as well. Well, you certainly found your communications calling. I'm sorry <laughs> that it's yours, but thank you for sharing it with us. We are so honored to just be in your presence and have you talk about real important things that matter. Thanks, Dane. Thank you so much. We do want to leave you with one more gentle reminder. Help is always available, and you're not alone in what you're feeling. NAMI offers free programs all across the country. Just scan the QR code on your screen to start finding help. And by the way, you heard in our interview from our Syracuse station, one mom say her son had a plan. You heard Zane say that. If someone you love is struggling and talking about suicide, do not shut them down. Ask them that question. Do you have a plan? If you can get them to tell you about their plan, you can often take steps to help interrupt it and perhaps save a life. No matter who you are, no matter where you are today, we hope you heard that it is okay sometimes not to be okay, but help is always available. I'm medical reporter Liz Bonus. Thank you for watching, everybody. Stay well and stay tuned.